the idea, okay, you, you got probably at least the, the, the framework where we are working, the big picture is I have beliefs, I collect data, I update my beliefs. How can we use this in our experiment? So, yes? <laughs> so, um, uh, thanks to Julio, we are uploading the slides on uh, the Dropbox uh, that he used this morning to share the, um, the scripts of art, so you can find the slides already there, so if you, especially for those who are away from the projector, maybe this is helpful, and that's Marco for the suggestion. Um, so there should be there already. Um, okay, so now let's try to to use this uh, this main idea of updating mm -hmm. uh, beliefs with uh, uh, with data. Okay, this is, remember is here because it, it's supposed that this is after lunch, but we can skip. So we may um, put the the accent on two different aspects when we consider uh, Bayesian statistics. On one side, um, typically, at least people that use Bayesian statistics tend to focus or on the estimation of the parameters. So I want to understand how, where uh, um, is my uh, parameter of interest and how much credibility I have around these uh, parameters. So the narrower the, uh, the distribution, the more precise the estimation. Indeed, sometimes it's called also precision of, uh, of my posterior. And uh, um, it's one focus that we may have. Um, another uh, focus that is mm, more uh, used, probably also because it's easier to use somehow, um, um, is putting the, uh, the the focus on the evidence, which means putting the focus on the data we said. But the evidence, what is the evidence? The evidence is the statistical evidence is the data, but in the context of the probability model. Okay, so this is another uh, version, but it's always the same of the um, bias theorem. And the idea is that the, the evidence is this thing. So is the likelihood of my data under a certain hypothesis. And it's divided by the average likelihood, whatever the other hypothesis uh, can be under that theta parameter. OK? So and that's the, the difficult part for the calculation with the Bayesian statistics, is calculating this average likelihood, the marginal likelihood. Um, so um, the effect of the data, we said um, maybe we can go quick uh, on this part because we already discussed this. The idea is that what I have is a prior distribution, then I observe my data, I multiply my prior by my, um, my data, and I obtain my uh, posterior, which basically integrates the two sources of information. It's like having two sources of information, try to combine them, and having a new uh, belief. But it's, it's a real multiplication. Um, OK, so um, we can look at this, and this uh, um, with these few points. So when we look at the posteriors, we are looking at the best estimation of our parameters given all the information that they have. Again, either from the prior or from the data. When I look at the likelihood, when the likelihood uh, has sufficient uh, strength, so I have a lot of data, this forms my, my prior quite quickly especially if I do few information on my prior. That's why we are stressing the point of the prior, because it's important, because it's a key for the Bayesian statistics. But we will see soon that if, if we do not exaggerate in putting our prior in our, in our models, then it's OK. It's just a matter of balancing enough uh, data to have uh, strong evidence that we shift it. OK. And again, there, there have been different attempts of giving non-informative priors, but yeah, you can find in the literature, but there's no an agreement on that. So it exists, you may look at it. I, I am not the expert on that. And 
at this time, probably I won't suggest you use it because there's no agreement on the non-informative product. Okay, we can extend our um, our approach to multiple parameters, so we can uh, plug much more complex uh, models. But when we do that, uh, it can be complicated to to uh, calculate the the marginal likelihood, so the non the denominator of our uh, bias factor. And uh, in these cases, um, luckily, uh, we, we uh, have been developed um, mechanisms to approximate uh, the posterior distribution. And having the posterior, we can go back and calculate uh, our uh, evidence um, of the uh, in, in the bias theorem. Um, okay. So. Um, Honestly, I don't know why um, there are people that only put the attention on the bias factor and people that only put the attention on the on the estimation. These two are connected, and we see we will see that basically when you calculate one, you almost directly have the, the other. Sometimes it's necessary to add it. Um, so I don't know why, but that's what uh, what we were also discussing. Is so you can find papers that never mention the credible interval. Even if they calculate the, the bias factor from the posterior, so they have it in their computer, is there, but they don't report. <laughs> so it's something that um, it's in the literature right now, and I don't know if it will change. But that's okay. So, what we can do um, with the bias factor, which is again the, the probably the, the, the most common uh, report. In, in Bayesian statistics is to do something like this. So we can calculate uh, the, uh, the, the odds of one model over another. So we can have, uh, uh, for example, in this case, the probability of a model zero, let's say, given the data, and it's odds against model one, okay? We can have the, here, for example, a model with a, a distribution centered on zero, so the model is zero or not, okay? Or different from zero. And our bias factor reflects this because it, it's uh, always um, in a proportion. So if we can calculate the posterior and we have the prior because we set the prior, we can then derive also the odds in the bias factor. What uh, does it mean? Well, in, a, in words, it's the relative probability of the data under the hypothesis is exactly the strength of the relative statistical evidence between the two hypotheses. It means that if my bias factor is three, it means that it's three times more likely that my data, given the prior blah, 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 blah fit better with that model than with the other one. So that model is two times better than the other one with the bias factor, given all the assumption on the prior and how we believe on that. And, uh, well, this is probably too much, but, um, okay, this is an example. If I have this long number with 2.19082, uh, blah, 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 it means that my model one is 2.190872 better than the other in um, given reason of my data. So the weight of evidence is two times more or less um, better under one hypothesis than the other. What does it mean? It means that if my beliefs, um, my prior beliefs were, for example, on the zero, okay, I have to update I have two times more reasons that it's under the other model, for example. Is it a lot to shift my beliefs? That's the question that answered the bias factor. Do I have such strong evidence to change my mind from the prior, to say my data shift from that prior under that model with respect to the other one? Okay? So, we have now more or less standards, but the point is that um, this number reflects this kind of intuitive way of, of comparing two models, because it's, it's odds of probability of one model over the other. 
Okay. Um, so I think we, we should, um, because we're going a little bit on more on the practical part, so we should digress a bit on this um, part. So we said that it can be complicated to um, calculate the uh, marginal likelihood. How do we do that now? We use Monte Carlo Markov chains. Uh, we can use uh, Gibbs sampler, which is not, it's part probably of, a, a, it's a Markov chain, but it's not a Monte Carlo because uh, there's not uh, the probabilistic part, uh, but it's a detail, this one. Um, or we can have approximations, uh, and we will see that. But these are probably the most important part to understand. Um, so when we cannot calculate uh, our um, marginal likelihood, we cannot calculate the posterior because we have nothing to multiply with the prior, and we should approximate it. And we can do it using uh, this algorithm, this family of algorithms, um, that basically are useful for um, for approximating complex, uh, complicated system with statistical samples. What does it mean? We, it means that we um, randomly select, um, we, we sample from the posterior, we calculate the probability, and we can um, reconstruct how the, the, the posterior is. And we will see a bit better, but the way it works is more or less like this. A mark of change means that it's a walk where um, the actual value is uh, uh, directly related to the previous one, but only to the previous one, and not the next, the previous one, and so on and so forth, just the previous one. At the Monte Carlo, it means there's, there are some uh, random um, steps within that. Okay, so what uh, this is a representation of a real um, random walk, so it can be thought as a random walk, uh, the use of a, of a Monte Carlo uh, Markov chains, and you see basically we have two parameters here, and you see each dot is a, a sample, okay, and we can try to move from one sample to another one and using different algorithms this is the metropolis this is the gibbs you have slightly different behaviors in the capability of mapping your space of parameters so the probability of each parameter and uh, the some other some algorithm works more efficiently some other are more precise but usually you don't really choose exactly which sampler you use because usually it's built in on the program that you are using even if it's R or just just for example use bias factor I, I tell you more on this but uh, use both in different tests so if you're running a, a bias uh, a t test with Bayesian statistics you are using a Gibbs probably usually you are using a Gibbs or you are analytically solving the, the integral if you can do it if you are running um, uh, Bayesian ANOVA, you are running a, a different model and it's used another package in R, uh, which uses STAN, and STAN works with uh, this kind of algorithm and adds some other fancy stuff to, to calculate more precisely um, the, the space parameter. What does it change? It changes that in this occasion it's quite quick and typically good in the precision but if you have problems with your distribution it can stuck in a certain uh, position for example if you have two parameters um, highly correlated one with each other you may not be able to explore the space of your parameters so you you can have wrong um, solutions uh, while in this case it takes a lot of time a lot of time it's, it works better but for example, you, you can run a two by two design in half an hour with normal laptop. So it can take a lot of time. Sometimes it's two minutes. It depends on your, your parameters, but it can take long. This is also push to design <coughs> the value of analysis in advance because you don't want to waste tries. Okay, so how we um, Again, I, I told you that it's implemented in the, the environment that you are using, so as soon as you get more and more skilled, maybe you choose the package because of the sampler, so you can also make your decision uh, motivated by that. By now, probably not. But these are um, 
convenient simple to, to convenient methods to run uh, Bayesian analysis, I would suggest JASP, that it's what you have on your laptop now. It's designed, it starts from dif disseminating the use of uh, Bayesian statistics, although you can do also frequentist um, analysis with it. Uh, you, now there's a module also in SPSS, I'd say. I never used it, but I know that the, the, the implemented the module also in SPSS, and there is also in Jamovi, but the one in Jamovi is just a, a, a code translation from the JASP team. So basically, you are using exactly the same uh, formula. So uh, I think just is better. For uh, this is for a uh, user interface system. Uh, the difference is that it's easy to run, it's easy to to use, but they are a little less flexible. And flexibility is a big plus for Bayesian statistics. So if you have to do simple things, I strongly suggest to go with that. If you need something more specific and personalized, you cannot simply cannot do it with, uh, with this uh, uh, software. So you have to shift in this work, uh, which is all the ARM-based uh, packages. So you, you can have STAN. STAN is this one. is the most complicated one, and you need to be extremely expert. I can do just very little, little things with the STAN. It's very complicated. But you, you, you can do whatever you want with STAN. BRMS instead is a very good package um, that uh, is more very similar to LME4, a package that Julie already mentioned today, and maybe we will see in the next days when we speak about uh, hierarchical models, because it's the most common uh, package used for hierarchical models. So I guess they, it will be presented, and BRMS has the same syntax, basically. So, uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, LMA4, uh, BRMS is uh, an easy uh, pass. And bias factor instead is the the engine of JASP for the basic statistics. So for the for the bias factor for the t-test, Bayesian t-test, it runs on bias factor. So everything that you can do with JASP, you can do with a bias factor in the uh, environment. So we are working on this because we thought that it's enough for, for, for now, uh, but you can extend easily in bias factor, or all the things that we are going to see now. And in BRMS, it's a little more complicated. If you if you want, we can do it. I, I have some backup slides on BRMS if we say time, but I don't think so. And this is JAX. This is the one with the, with the other sampler. So when you are aware of your sampling method, you can switch to JASP. OK, so quick introduction to JASP. First, give credit to those who had it. So um, I, I just present uh, Wagner Marcus because he is the CEO of the, of the program, of the, of the JASP team. But it's a big team, and they, I think, work very nicely. And they are open science. Uh, uh, inspired so everything is open and there's a lot of material and they invite to share and to and to introduce people to, to this so also the, the open science spread I think it's a, it's quite nice although it's not super easy to access the code that runs under and they're just that's a, a drawback I have to say but that's it um, okay, just uh, means Jeffrey's amazing statistical program. Uh, Jeffrey is one of the main developer of uh, of Bayesian statistics, so it's again give credit to those men. And uh, this is the way that the just pre present themselves. Um, so this is SPSS. This is just. I have to say that if it's true, then this is R. Okay, keep in mind that it's still stick with their rules if you move in just if you want your own rule you have to switch to, to R. so and going back to this morning uh, discussion why switching to R for example this is a good idea of why switching to R because you have all the flexibility that you want and in Bayesian statistics if you become expert you really want that flexibility then you have to justify and convince your reviewer. But as a researcher, you want that flexibility. And so maybe you want to switch to, to R at a certain point. But as a um, naive user of uh, Bayesian statistics, JASP is wonderful. It's amazing. So um, 
is a graphical representation of uh, uh, of the steps. It just is the first steps. Bias factor is the second step in your Bayesian stair. Then there are BRMS, jugs, and stun. Stun is for professional use. Let's see. And it's very intuitive again, and there's really a lot of material. Uh, they prepare a lot of material uh, constantly to, to learn how to use it. So I, I give you a quick introduction to it, but uh, I'm pretty sure that you will be able also to, to extend your uh, your use of just by yourself. Um, okay, so well, we can skip this. Maybe go a little faster. So. If you already installed just this slide, is uh, um, um, meaningless uh, because it's just how to do that. Uh, but for those who didn't, it will be on the slides. And that's how it presents. We already familiarized with these bars. You have this hamburger button is where you have the option save and all the stuff related to the file where you can open files. You have the main bar of all the main uh, um, blocks of the analysis that you can do. Uh, it's taught for frequentism, but it's taught for Bayesian, but now it, it's more articulated in different kind of analysis, also complicated things. And with the plus button, you can add different modules. Um, although you are not installing like in Jamovi that you download the package and you install the package, it's already built in in your program. You are just uploading the, the, the bar, the menu but it, it, it's already downloaded everything. So under the plus button, you find the learn bias, for example, but all the basic uh, Bayesian statistics are already built in in the t-test, ANOVA, regression, and frequencies, and, and that's it. Um, so that's the environment, uh, and that's how you can, for example, add modules to your uh, uh, analysis. Um, okay, it reads a lot of uh, formats. The best one probably is .csv, but it reads also .sav, .txt, so it's uh, uh, pretty okay. It doesn't open directly Excel file, but you can just say the CSV. It's easy to, to import data. Um, it has automatic detection of the variable level and some fancy stuff like this, but in my opinion, it doesn't work extremely well. So just look at uh, how it classifies the data as, uh, if you open your own database, because sometimes we classify as ordinal variable something that it's not. Sometimes uh, it doesn't recognize properly all the variables. In general, um, you can also um, manage the data sets with introducing filters or having a calculated variables, but it's pretty inefficient for managing data sets. And uh, I won't suggest to manage the data set within just, although you can do it. I suggest to do it elsewhere, and you can do it in R, you can do it in Excel, do whatever you want, but um, prepare your data and then import the data into the just software. And it's graphic user uh, software, so it's easy because you have this nice menu where you just have to mm -hmm. click on, for example, test. You select your test. It opens this window where you can uh, manage all your variables and do all the analysis that you want. You, this is called control panel. And uh, imagine that you have three uh, different panels, one side of the other, the data. Side, in, in between, there's the control panel, and on the right, there's the output. And the output is immediately calculated as soon as you input something in your control panel, which means that if you are running a, a quick analysis, it's super convenient because it's easy. It's already updating all the results. But if you are running an analysis that takes half an hour, it crashes the computer. So again. It's good software, it's not perfect software. Uh, if you're running a big complicated model with uh, hours of uh, calculation time, uh, just wait before uh, <laughs> inputting the, the dependent variable. Just wait for a small bit. 
Um, okay, that's something. This is a, a quick all about. Um, is a bit all this uh, this uh, uh, list, but it's something that you can do yeah, with all these basic tests. You can have your frequentist frequentist test and the um, paired Bayesian version of the same test. So it's pretty, really, pretty easy to to understand and run. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Is that something similar to the syntax, like of SPSS, to uh, like make the story of your analysis? Uh, no, because you don't have a syntax here mm -hmm. in Jasper. That's one of the uh, drawbacks of the software. And uh, no, 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 you don't have the history of your analysis. As hard. soon as you change something, it updates your results, and that's what you will get. Does it uh, underline? Uh, uh, is any R under the under just? Like yeah, yeah, it works on. Uh, it, yeah, the point is that it's not uh, open the code. Right. Right. <laughs> but uh, the, I think that that's one. I, I I really don't understand. Well, I understand because they. they we save all the things that they want to do with it. But it's free, so it's not that they are making money mm -hmm. on it, yes. but they are keeping control. I mean, the kind of back behind the scenes story is that the founder of um, Jamal okay. was, the pro was the one who developed uh, JASP, and he, he had a fight with the uh, bug etc. Uh -huh. this. Because Jamal is a free and uh, code that you can add things, but as very markets wanted to have control over the code, uh, Christopher Law, mm -hmm. and he came, he decided to, to do his own software, Jamovi. So Jamovi was done, yeah. has been done, he's done, by one of the ones who did also just. This is why this And that's why they are so on similar. <laughs> on the availability of the syntax. It's exactly yeah, yeah. It's exactly this, the open yeah. nature. Yeah, in my opinion, it's weird because they are really open science uh, promoters of the groups behind the job. So I mean, the reason was if they wanted to have control over the quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, but uh, I mean, their software, the decision that they want. But yeah, you don't. There's our uh, every analysis run on some R packages, um, and you can have the list clicking on this. Uh, blue eye dot button. You can go. Uh, maybe I, I should have one. Act is over there. Oh. Uh, because uh, I thought about the reproducibility of the analysis. If you want to make it all open, it becomes a problem if you cannot make the your analysis open. Uh, well. You cannot show the history of all the analysis that you did. Yes, you're right. <laughs> no, no, you're right. But yeah, let's open all these ones. <laughs> didn't work, didn't open. Uh, let's open just one data set. I mean, I want. There's another bug. If you have one open, then you have to restart to open a new one. But you get used easily to this. Uh, okay. Usually it works better, but mm -hmm. go back to this. Um, under this I button, you have all the details of the analysis that you are running, including the R packages that uh, are uh, working behind the scene, let's say. Um, all the assumption required, you have all the details, and also the references of, uh, of the analysis uh, that you are running. So the I button is uh, precious. Uh, other additional stuff you can add comments so if you need to share your results with other people you can write on uh -huh. your output so it's easy 
uh, it's a nice uh, software in general. And you can export your results in HTML5, which is quite light for uh, sharing it. So the output is appended. Uh, every time you make a new analysis, it is appended below the previous one. No, it's, it's overwriting the previous one. If it's within the same uh, analysis block, you can open uh, your Bayesian to test all the times that you want. So you can have a sequence of, well, you can have a, a matrix of Bayesian. Now you, I, I show you. Okay. Right. I think it's much easier if I show you. Or you can also work on it. So just as uh, some uh, databases uh, um, already pre installed so you can open just go onto uh, kitchen row so just go here open data library so these are within the, the software t test you, you these are uh, organized to for demonstrative purposes so you can understand what's the meaning of the data sets included but of course you can do whatever you want so you run kitchen rolls for example and you see if you click here you see all the data and um, you have already a few analysis pre-run pre because they, they want to open it for demonstrative purposes so here we are. So this um, data set um, reports this, uh, um, this data. It's the new PIR about, I don't remember which construct, maybe it's open, openness to experience. And um, they wanted to test if uh, uh, rotating uh, uh, some kitchen roll uh, on the clockwise or counterclockwise have an impact on the way you self-report your openness to experience. I don't know exactly the hypothesis behind, but that's what they did. <laughs> so they reported the original paper for this. Okay, so everything is uh, described in the, in the software, so nothing very important. We can explore with the JASP, so we have good, uh, nicely, uh, also descriptive uh, uh, statistics. One key point is that you cannot modify in any way the, the graphical uh, output. So the graph that you get is what you will have from it. So if it's fine with, uh, with the bars, fine. If it's not, pick the data and draw by yourself. <laughs> That's, yeah, it's not that flexible. It's nice software, but it's not flexible. And okay, sorry, I go. Okay, so let just let me check. Okay, now we can. You can also do it by yourself if you want, but we can explore it now. We see the I bottom that I showed you, you you saw it opens this window where everything is described about all the things that you can do and also in my opinion very important of course it describes basically what does it mean but very important to me there's there are the references about all the stuff that you are running with the software and the R packages that um, are working and you see bias factor is easier and these others are just for the um, for the graphical representation ggplot2 and log spline are basically for, uh, for graphical representation so everything for the bias factor is working for the t-test is working on bias factor and what we have well we um, when we want to run the analysis we have this control panel and I put better in the slides. What I have to do is to just take and put my variable, dependent variable, in my menu. May I, may I have a lot, so I can have my table of tests, like the t-test in SPSS. Um, so, uh, I can run multiple tests within the same uh, um, the same block. If I need to run multiple blocks of the same analysis, I can open, I can open a new Bayesian t-test, for example, and so that I can have 
all, uh, all of them. I can also copy, this is something that they added, so I can copy the analysis with the plus button, so it reproduces exactly what is running here, so if I need only to change one thing, it's better if I copy the analysis like this, you see, copy of Bayesian, and maybe I only change this stuff. I don't know why I need to add this one, but let's say, uh, for example, I, only, I want to make a non-directional hypothesis, so I can change only this one, and so now I have both the directional and non-directional uh, hypothesis test. So this is helpful, actually. Okay, so what I have here, I put my dependent variables and the grouping variable. Here I mean the independency test, so different groups, but I can have for the paired and uh, so it's pretty uh, much the same. Which is the grouping variable you have it? In this case, it's rotation. So it's the variable of interest if I'm, run, I'm rotating the clock on the clockwise direction or counterclockwise. And uh, my dependent is the mean openness to experience self-report uh, of all the items. And here I reported uh, actually two uh, outputs because I changed the alternative hypothesis. In one case, we are testing um, the classic, it's different, group one is different from group two. In uh, this other case, it's uh, uh, for it's greater than. So I tested, I changed group one is bigger than group two, okay? And we will see, I guess, a good, yes. Okay, so the main output is this thing. Here is reported the bias factor, which we said that it can be read that one hypothesis over the other is four times more likely. In this case, and you can understand from how it's written here, is the null hypothesis is four times more likely than the alternative hypothesis. So it's four times more likely that there's no difference than there is difference. It's like this. Why? Because I switch this button here, which is bias factor, can be bias factor one over zero, so alternative over null, or bias factor null over alternative, but it's just reciprocal, so it doesn't change anything. It's just for easiness to read. To make it easier to read. So very minor thing, but if you have slightly different results, yes, normal. It's not yes, it's because it, it, it's uh, sampled the posterior, and uh, uh, it means that it, it slightly change every time. If you close your software and you rerun, it slightly change because you can set the seat, but <laughs> that's another problem. Not in uh, the t-test, you can set when you run uh, the ANOVA. You can set the seed, so you will always have the same um, results, like Julia was saying uh, this morning. For the test, they didn't implement the set seed, I don't know why, so you will have slightly different results every time because it's sampled mm -hmm. from uh, the procedure. Um, and that's also why they report this percentage of error, because it's the approximation that you will get from the posterior, you, you have these degrees of error in the approximation of the bias factor. Um, okay, so I, I put the zero one because it's more intuitive to read all, always in the direction of the best model. So my best model is four times better than the other because otherwise here I would have had uh, 0.25 more or less, which is less intuitive but it's exactly the same. Uh, okay, and you can change the hypothesis, of, and of course, uh, like for the normal t-test, you have uh, test for that hypothesis. What does it mean, changing the hypothesis? It means something like this. You see, we have the prior for the null hypothesis is distributed from the zero, both on the negative and on the positive side. If I say it's bigger than, I assume that it's not smaller than, so I put zero here, and remember, if I cut the space of possibility at a certain point, there's no evidence that will convince me that it's less than, okay? So that's why you have this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, distribution. And now, if we ask for prior and posterior plot 
and I strongly suggest to also ask for the additional info. Mm -hmm. You have these nice graphs where you have your prior on the dashed line and posterior with the solid line plotted. You have the credible interval, because you always estimate the credible interval. So uh, you have the numbers of the credible interval in the bracket here, but you also have the graphical representation of the credible interval with this uh, mm -hmm. bar. I have a question, uh, so, because I know it's important. So, in this example, for instance, yes. if it's BF0, 1, or plus, it, and it's uh, uh, a number above 1, uh, above 3, for instance. Yes. That means uh, there are uh, more uh, support for the null hypothesis. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And only if it was BF one zero, it would be the, the support for. Exactly. The, we can uh, see it. I can show you practically. Let's see. So, you see, usually the default is bias factor one zero. Means yeah. how much evidence do you have that the alternative hypothesis it works? Let's say works better than the null. Okay. In this case the bias factor for the alternative above the null is 0.27. Okay? Remember, 1 means that I have the, the same odds for the two. I, I'm in the situation of total uncertainty. <coughs> the two models work exactly the same in, in, in fitting my, my, my data. Uh, okay? So if I go below one, I'm giving advantage, I'm giving uh, support. The evidence is supporting the denominator of my ratio. If I'm above one, I'm giving support um, to the numerator. Okay? Mm -hmm. Numerator and denominator are defined by one zero or zero one. And so it's the order. new standard here is 3 and 0 0.3. Yes and no. Just say yes. It's three, but they, they also um, um, pair the numerical uh, support with the sum tag. So they say moderate evidence. So yeah, discuss it, but play down. <laughs> Up to ten, nobody would question if there's evidence or not. Let's say that over ten or one tenth. You have to be safe with your decision. There are other orders um, that say that suggest to use six as lower boundary. And if you run a bias factor design analysis, usually you want to have at least six. But they, these are other thresholds. I mean, it, it makes sense only if you if you have in mind why you are setting this kind of threshold and what you want to say. That's always the same point. If I have to bet my uh, my one billions of uh, one things, I probably I would have more evidence than this. <laughs> That's the point. But it's very depending also on the player. Yes, but we will see what, how much. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty easy to change. Uh, you see, if I, I switch this one. It reverts and it's three well, points ahead. That is one point that is not clear to me. I mean, uh, the, there are in fact, in fact two times here. One is that there is, there is no effect, and the other that there is an effect. No, but the prior is uh, you have the distribution of the difference, and you put the prior over the fact that it's zero. You are using the prior to have evidence that it's zero or not. Now you are okay. somehow using the prior. To have your uh, evidence in support more, more it's, this is quite similar to the logic of the mm -hmm. normal t test, uh, indeed, because you are really guessing that it's zero, uh, although you don't believe so. Otherwise, you won't probably run your experiment. But you, you say, okay, let's say that it's zero. How much evidence that I have that instead I was right to run the experiment and it's not zero? So that's the alternative. That's true. So you are using the logic behind prior, putting the, uh, the prior on zero to demonstrate that your data supports your alternative hypothesis. Okay. 
but it's one prior here. And okay, so I think we have to move a little quicker. Uh, okay, so nice stuff. You have this uh, pie chart that show how much evidence you have in one hypothesis or the other. This is a, an intuitive, immediate way to say, okay, I have a lot of uh, evidence or not. Mm -hmm. If you see something red, still it's, it's okay. It's stronger for the white, but mm -hmm. still not so much. When it's super strong, you don't see any other color of, of the red or the white. When you have 10, basically, you don't see the other code. So now we, we, we go to something a little more interesting in my view. So let's go to how much we can rely on our uh, conclusions. This is sequential analysis, and you ask just by clicking these two buttons, sequential analysis and robustness check. Robustness check, uh, I suggest to do it only if you run the robustness check analysis. Otherwise, it's not that meaningful, but we can talk about it. Um, what you do, uh, as we saw previously with the, with the estimation, we are doing the same with our tests. So here we are running uh, the analysis of the bias factor after each participant is added to our um, uh, model. Uh, and we see that <laughs> Time by time, the evidence is increasing, but never uh, surpass the, the threshold of three. Okay, this is a <coughs> zero one, so you always have on the graph evidence for H zero. Okay, after a certain point, we have this uh, fall, let's say, that justify why we never go over the threshold because data probably weren't that strong to go there. But as soon as we increase the sample we reach stability and you see that after the 75th participant, 65th participant, you never change basically your evidence. Okay? So this conclusion would suggest you to say, yeah, I have moderate evidence in support of H0. Your moderate can be translated in numbers. I have four times more evidence of H0 than H1. And I could be pretty sure, but if I show this graph, and I am another researcher, I could say, yeah, but you didn't convince me that much because you've been so much uncertain for so much and uh, for so much time that I'm not very convinced by your evidence and we can uh, continue to discuss. So maybe I can ask uh, to increase the participants uh, uh, up to you reach 10 of bias factor. Yes. I don't know if I'm a fan of these because uh, then, then you are saying, that your interpretation of the bias factor changes according to the order in which you collect the participants. Why? Because, I mean, um, for example, if you collect the participant that, that caused the drop, uh, for example, at the very beginning, then you would have stayed more uh, confident, uh, apparently, for a longer time after collecting them. But this uh -huh. includes all the previous participants. So if these participants that make you drop were here, you still would round around this point at this stage. Yeah, but, but again, the, I mean, this is a, a check. This is not the, your result. Exactly. So the, the risk is, yeah. If probably if you have that, them at the beginning, you would have a base factor low around one third that grows steadily and then uh, is flat at some earlier point. Something like this. Increasing and increasing, so it seems like. Well, uh, I think the best way <laughs> is, to, is to say when, that when your evidence are strong, you never change the direction. Okay. So when your evidence are strong, you always go in, in one direction. Because uh, increasing the number of participants, even if the, the effect remains the same, narrows your distributions and this increases the bias factor. So, I'm about so if the effect is stable and it's strong, it increases always in one of the two directions. Uh, not precisely, if I can. From a point up, up to a certain point, it, it is both sides. Yes. From a point up, uh, Given that it becomes smaller, I mean, it's a competency that it becomes smaller. Given that it's smaller, 
the estimate becomes nearer to the true parameter. If the true parameter is above the line, then it gives you the impression that it's always above the line. But this happens above and so. And with this design depends on the effect size to start. So the point being, one has to be careful in mm -hmm. terms of interpreting data, uh, I mean, children, this answer, interpret the trend of data because in principle this is arbitrary, the way yes, the order is the data, easy. unless there is an insult. Unless the data, I mean, the sequence of the data means something. Yes. But otherwise, it's just arbitrary. And you can have, statistically, I mean, probabilistically speaking, you can have four kinds of sequences starting from one from the other. I think this is something which I'm going to show because mm -hmm. I have a slide on this. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so I need to say, yeah. what I would perhaps put attention more on is the, um, how much is the, you know, the range of variation of the results as a function of the assumption of the... Yes, we will see later and better. Huh? The, the prior will check. Yeah. We will see later a bit better. Okay. Um, yes, one, one just little follow-up. Remember that this is not the parameter estimation, but this is the bias factor. So if the increase would be there even if the parameters stay constant, if all the participants goes in the same direction, have the same, for example, imagine that this is a within design. So every participant has the same difference. You have a parameter that stands always in the same point. So if the difference is minus one, let's say, you have your parameter that stands in minus one, but your bias factor increased because you narrow your, you increase the precision of your estimation and it increased how much you shift from the, the prior. That's why I was saying that, that if you have a linear trend in your data, because it's summing your evidence, it's not that that subject deviates. These subjects deviate, but only summed to all the previous one. So it's not a matter of subject number 59. It's a matter of the first 59 subject in these readings. Of course, if you put this one over there, you already collected also the other 99. So you still have this value of bias factor. Yeah, but see, you so you're right when you say that at the beginning it's more random, the movements. So you, you may have more, it goes up and down, it depends on the, the sequence that you acquire, but if you have a sample of 100, you will always end up with this last five values. Because the previous 94, yeah, it could be different. Yes. Not the last five, just the last one. The last one is exactly, of course, but it, more or less it will be always the same, the last I guess five. what I'm trying to say is that if you have 59 participants, yeah. And then from 50 to 60, yeah. uh, the impact, the, I mean, the kind of variation in data that you need is much smooth, is smaller than the variation in data that you need from 200 to 210. Mm -hmm. In the sense of the stabilized, the parameters more stable. Mm -hmm. Which means that up to over a certain end, this is, can be informative. Below a certain end, you can have wide yes, I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, so I the trend per se says something only above a certain end. Below a certain end, you have a lot of values. I think. And my point was that uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, eventually, this can never give you any more information than the only the bias factor. I agree. So uh, you look at the bias factor, and whether this one is better not to uh, overinterpret too much. Just add it up. Uh, um, no, no, the, uh, okay. This has been Bayesian the answer, Bayesian answer, yes, because this is the best, um, the, uh, the most information that you have, and Bayesian statistics assumes that you, tr you take conclusion, assuming that you analyze all the information that you have, because data are stable and parameters are well. So, from that point of view, it's okay. Indeed, it's I think can help to understand if the effect within your sample tend to be stable or not. So it drives your own confidence because if you always have a trend that your bias factor goes always in the same direction, 
as I said, for me, it increases the evidence uh, every time that you, well, that's how it, it's interpreted. Let's put it in this way, and then if you want, we can continue the discussion. <laughs> sure. That's how it's interpreted. I may ask another thing before we yes. move. Uh, there are three trials here, right? Yes, wife, yes. Uh, Maybe I missed it. If yes, I didn't it. speak about it yet, because it's in a, in a it's because, here. Okay. <laughs> I searched it, but we never defined the priors, right? It's here, and I, I, yeah, I will show you where okay. to define the priors. So, we have these three that are that are points of interest, wide and ultra wide, or user. User is the one that you define, and we will see how to define the prior. Now it's a standard prior, let's say. Uh, wide is, let's say, it's more wide, and so it's more fat, let's say, it's thicker cube. And ultra wide, it's almost a flat prior. Almost a flat prior. This, uh, how we we should read this. Uh, wide and ultra wide tend to uh, favor uh, favorite um, the null hypothesis for the way it works, the bias factor. Because uh, for the way it works, they tend to increase the probability to have support for the null hypothesis. So um, consider when you when you read it then. But here you have only these three, but if you want to run a, a prior with a, a robustness check, you can uh, run this bias factor robustness check and, and ask for the additional if it's just having this number above. If you don't pick this one, you have only the graph. And in this case, you see how the bias factor change on changing in a continuous way your, um, uh, your prior width. Okay? So you, we still have um, the user, the wide, and the ultra wide. User, wide, and ultra wide. Okay, but we also have a continuous representation on, of uh, how the bias factor change according to the change of uh, the the prior width. So how much uh, narrow or not is my uh, prior? Of course, at zero, it's always zero because we said that it's one point. Okay, so it starts always like from from here. The point is uh, how to interpret this graph. Again, although probably Julian neither here will, be, um, uh, will agree, you can look at the trend. So if, if it tends to go in one direction and don't change, you probably would trust more on, uh, on the robustness of your results because whatever the prior you put, it's always the same the conclusion. Okay? You see, just a quick, um, um, a quick feedback. If I put 0.5, it would be around 3. If I put 1.5 in the prior width, I would have almost 10. Okay, so it changed a lot, but it doesn't change the qualitative conclusion. Okay, so in this case, I'm pretty safe saying I have evidence for H0. They are not super strong because still we are speaking about moderate uh, effect, speaking of four times, so it's not a big bias factor. But I would discuss. I would make some some. Uh, I've never seen a, a, a paper in which this was discussed. I've only seen, or at least in my paper, we put just a, BF a BF for this. Yes, so this is a way to improve <laughs> the reliability. So that's still not a required. I, it's not required. That's one good point, uh, and and it's in the end of my slides. There are not strong standards for reporting Bayesian statistics. And this is pretty bad because everyone can put whatever he wants. We see, I change. I, I don't want to have a, an effect for for this. I put my prior at point two. I don't justify it, and I have it. So people who use just like it, the, the few times I did it, I just type in. I see a value yes. and I copy this. It's value. a risk. So so what 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 does the program use? Is that a, 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 like now it says I, you have to choose that. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I uh, well, if you mm, plot these, if you give these as a, a as a result, you're saying one can check and, and see whatever you want. Um, the other one's uh, point zero five to give equal chance to do <laughs> hypothesis. And Sorry, the prior uh, is the the, the is point zero five. It's it's the, the prior. It's, the, it's not about the mean of the distribution. It's the win. The exactly. It's the width of the distribution. Oh, okay. I, I think I can show you somehow on the software, but just give me one second because I, I did it. Yes, good. 
<laughs> so we can change the prior. If we go down here, prior, we can change the prior. Initially, you couldn't. Now they implemented more and more options because people asked for it. And now you have the default is the Couchy with the scale uh, 0.707, the one that I told you, which worked pretty well with the bias factor. We said it's a good way to estimate the bias factor. If you have no idea on how to put priors, keep it in. If you have enough data, like for a normal frequentist experiment, let's say, so it's comparable uh, size, you will get reliable results. Another good point is that if you don't have reliable results, you will see it. Because the bias factor won't be big enough to make you uh, drive some conclusion. You will have these weird movements on your sequential analysis, or that we can discuss. <laughs> you won't have a prior width consistent with your results. So you have many indices that may make you say, maybe I have 3.5 of my bias factor, but uh, of course, you have to be honest with yourself. I'm not convinced of my results. Again, if you surpass 10, it's hard to have something to change your qualitative decision of saying there's or there's not yet. If you don't reach 10, you always have to be careful with your conclusions. This is not also depending on, on the sample size in a way. Yes. Because it may depend on the sample size. Yes, yes. It may depend on your sample size. Uh, of course. Ten, of course. Unless it's a big I, I, I didn't bring it, but uh, the bias factor design as an analysis basically say something like this. I start from 30 participants, and I set a threshold of at, at least an evidence of 10. I will continue to collect data until I reach this evidence because I believe that 10 is enough evidence to conclude in favor of something. If it's reached with 30, good, I stay there. Otherwise, I collect other 5, other 10, other 10, until I have enough information to decide if going with H0 or H1. Because there's another, this is another advantage. So you can go also against uh, H1. You can go in favor of H0. But there is not a problem of multiple testing. No. Yeah, well, it's more complicated than this, but short answer, no. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are some discussion if you run a, a really multiple test, not in collecting multiple participants within your test because of that principle of update. If you run multiple T-test, maybe we, we, there are opinions. If you don't have the other you hide all the Yes, yes, please. This is a point. Uh, in the paper, I was one of the other the paper about the sequential that is fat in the matrix. There is a point in which you have a long discussion. At the end, in the, this, in the final conclusion, there is something which can be interpreted in that. This was a compromise between different positions. And this is exactly this point of the sequential, the impact of sequential multiple testing um, on parameter estimation. Now, in terms of, strictly speaking, the bias factor is protected by the sequential testing. So, it's correct, say. But the problem is, if you take a decision to stop collecting data, only if you have a significant parameter, if you do many experiments, or a series of studies, will over-report significant parameters, which mean that the, the parameters in every meta-analysis will conclude that there is a stronger effect than it exists. So there is a, 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 a bias parameter estimation in the literature, because you will stop only if you have a significant result, a go on if you have a significant result, which means you will not have data in which you have many participants and no significant result because that's what you already stopped with this last time. And he, I mean, the point was that if you assume that there is, um, I don't know, that every run is low, this is not a problem. Asymptotically, it's not a problem. Pragmatically, it is because decisions are made on them. Bottom line is, no errors. <laughs> if you don't trust 
a body or literature in which many people are using the sequential testing as a way to estimate the size of the effect. Will be bias. It will be bias. This is the same principle of publication bias. In terms of estimating the effect size, it will be bias. You can bet on it. That's it. But if you don't study, you are okay in the sense of you are explicitly doing what you should. You are protecting yourself. Okay, we saved about putting a limit on how many times you can do. Uh, from a Bayesian point of view, no, because you don't have a p yeah. See, In the frequentist approach, you can't do it, or well, every time you do it, you will change the interpretation of the p so, so that's a very big problem. But in Bayesian framework, technically speaking, there is no problem in this. As long as, from the beginning, you decide, test the trick. The beginning, you decide what is the evidence that you need to say stop. If you don't do that, then there is a risk. Because you are updating, but you didn't, you know, it's the difference between post hoc and pre hoc. If you decide pre hoc what is the level at which you stop, then you are safe. You can collect data, data, data until you have changed that. Level. There is no problem with multiple sequential tests. Next. Um. I think we have to run a bit. Um, okay, here you can change your uh, your distribution. You have options Cochi, Normal, and T. The one that I, I presented you in the previous lesson works fine. Um, you have a lot of uh, you. You can also change and put the, the distribution that you want. Yeah. Okay. That's where you can uh, uh, change your uh, your price. And and here you see, um, I changed, for example, the Cauchy. This is the standard one. I change and I reduce to a 0.5, and you see how it affects the results. And you see that it change also the bias factor. But uh, again, it doesn't change the final decision. So unless you really provide some strange um, priors or strong priors, or you have very few data. Yes, it impacts your analysis, but rarely change your uh, your final conclusions. Of course, if you are in 3.1, uh, yes, of course, it could be 2.9 and 3.2, I uh, guess. But there's where you would be uncertain, even if you have 3.1. OK. A little data is often still a problem. Yes. Um, <laughs> Bayesians used to say a little less because you can use prior to protect yourself from uh, strong conclusions with little data. For example, you can put a strong prior on zero if you have little data and if you have few data. So you and you and you don't want to conclude in favor of each zero, of course, because otherwise you are forcing yourself to, to trust in each zero. But you can use the prior to protect yourself from, from taking conclusions. On a small sample size, but I don't personally don't agree too much with that. But a, Bayesian, a pure Bayesian would say that you can use the <coughs> to protect yourself from small samples, which is certain, in certain ways true. But you have to use the prior carefully. Okay, I already reported this, um, but now I want to show you this uh, experiment because we spoke about uh, these priors a lot. This is a very nice, uh, in my opinion, paper. They used this meta-analytic data set and they asked to several experts to um, give their um, their uh, priors. They, these are informed priors by experts that express their priors and they also use the um, standard priors. So for the t-test, they use the Cauchy. For the correlation, they use the uniform from 0 to 1, uh, which are standard priors for this uh, kind of test. And what they found analy um, analyzing their data with these with this seven set of priors, basically six are from informed uh, priors and one is the default. They analyze the direction of the bias factor, which is just going above below zero, 1. Okay, so it's going toward H0 or going toward H1. And you see that uh, basically all the expert and the default works well, probably is just expert 1 that had this uh, strange uh, prior elicitation. And you can also see here, this is the prior of expert 1, okay, and also here. 
if you see why probably it doesn't correlate that much and this uh, second one is on the other data set so it works well both from the delta and from the correlations and in this case in study it um, evaluate the agreement between the, um, the qualitative conclusions so say moderate strong or very strong um, in one direction so it's not just changing the slide but it also the qualitative conclusion and again I mean, it works pretty well. It's not that much that change changing the prior. Of course, it has an impact. Sometimes it can change your your direction of conclusions. But I think this is quite good evidence that if you don't really pick a weird prior, then it tends to converge to a, a reasonable result. And they did also other more refined uh, analysis that where in this case they show that. If you instead consider the exact value of the bias factor, this change a lot. This change a lot. But again, it, it changed from 40 to 8. Yes, but still you conclude strongly in one direction. 